All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Adam, Content Marketing Specialist with Henry Schein, and I'll be your moderator. Today's webinar focuses on first-line strategies for pain management. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A section, and we will answer them live at the end. This webinar is presented by Henry Schein Dental and sponsored by Septodont, and no CE credits are being offered for viewing or attending this presentation. I would like to welcome Dr. Stanley Malamed as our speaker. Dr. Malamed is a dentist, anesthesiologist, and emeritus professor of dentistry at the Herman Ostro School of Dentistry of USC in Los Angeles. He is a diplomat of the American Dental Board of Anesthesiology and has authored more than 160 scientific papers and 17 chapters in various medical and dental journals and textbooks in the areas of physical evaluation, emergency medicine, local anesthesia, sedation, and general anesthesia. Thank you, Dr. Malamed, for joining us tonight. Over to you. Adam, thank you very much. And uh, good evening or good afternoon to whomever is out there. Uh, as you just heard, I am a dentist anesthesiologist. I am originally from New York City. And my education is at NYU School of Dentistry. And I've been out here in California at the University of Southern California since 1973. Uh, this is the most recent edition, the seventh edition of my handbook on local anesthesia. Um, all I would recommend is that if you don't have it, please buy it. Uh, the Malamid family needs the income. Okay, um, I am a consultant. This is a disclosure slide. I am a consultant to a drug company, Septodont, and uh, we will dis be discussing a product that they do uh, sell. So again, this is um, disclosure that I am a consultant, paid consultant to Septodont. My email address. Um, I'll show it to you again at the end of the presentation, but even though we're going to have a chance for some questions and answers, uh, in case you want to contact me at the end of the program, tomorrow, whatever, um, and ask me for some articles or just queries about local anesthesia, medical emergencies, or sedation, my email address is malamed, M-A-L-A-M-E-D, at usc.edu. So what I uh, plan on doing in the next 50 minutes or so is talk about number one, the importance of local anesthesia in our dental profession. Number two, uh, the ability to administer painless injections. And number three, talk about a local anesthetic, articane. So we'll start out by talking about something I think is fairly obvious to everybody here, but the fact that local anesthetics are important in our profession. So let's take a look at dentistry. Most of you out there, most dentists, in fact, are general dentists. And the bread and butter dentistry is restorative work. Drill and fill. Patient has decay, we clean it out, we put in a, in today's world, a nice composite restoration. We treat children, pediatric dentistry. We do periodontal surgery, anywhere from scaling and root planing up to actual perio surgery to prevent the loss of good teeth due to the loss of bone and the soft tissue surrounding them. Endodontics, when the pulp of the tooth is infected, we clean it out, we mummify it, and we can rebuild that tooth. Or in some cases, teeth are extracted. And uh, many of you probably out there uh, have had your third molars extracted. Uh, all but one person I'm very aware of, I just found out, has all of his third molars in. Shame on him. And uh, exodontia. And in today's world, actually, uh, we now will re-implant teeth. We can put in dental implants in, and dental implants uh, in the United States are the number one implant that is done of all different types of implants. None of these were possible without effective pain control. Actually, they are possible, but it would hurt like heck. So we do need pain control. And this is really what our discussion is all about here today. It's about pain, and it's about pain and how we can get rid of it or prevent it from occurring. So let's then very, very simplistically look at what is pain. Now, we have a stick of dynamite, we have a fuse, and we have this androgynous person taking a match and lighting it. And when the flame burns along the fuse, when it reaches the dynamite stick, guess what happens? Boom, it explodes. So what I'm doing in this picture is substituting the brain for the dynamite stick the fuse, which is now being lit, is the nerve. 
you pick up a handpiece, a scalpel, a forceps, you stimulate that nerve, the nerve impulse is propagated. When that nerve impulse reached that patient's brain, ow, they felt pain. And that is a very simplistic view of what pain is. Stimulate the nerve, nerve impulse reaches the brain, patient responds. From a clinical perspective, however, we are practicing dentists. This to me is the only acceptable definition of pain. If that person sitting in your chair, the patient, says it hurts, you stop. Okay, you stop and you try to figure out what's going on. Is it real pain or is it psychological pain? Okay, real pain would be uh, you're cutting on a tooth, you've given your injection, you're cutting on a tooth, you get down to dentin, which is really the first test of pulpal anesthesia, and the patient goes out. That's real pain. How about the patient where they sit in a chair, you um, take an air water syringe and you blow the air at their mouth and they go out. And you're thinking, that can't hurt. But that patient is telling you that that hurts. You've had patients where you took your finger and you simply touched them on the lip, wearing gloves, of course, and they went out. Okay, that is psychological pain. And even though we're not gonna be discussing sedation here today, the fear of pain is producing this problem. So whether it's psychological pain or real pain, stop what you're doing, figure out what's going on and take care of the problem. If it's real pain, you have to go back and redo the injection or give a different injection or use a different drug. If it's psychological pain, okay, then we start dealing with the brain and that's where the concept of sedation comes in, even though that is not a part of today's program. The number one fear that dental patients have is fear of being hurt, fear of pain. This is a survey, and I've been showing this one survey for quite some time, but there are others like it. Uh, dentistry is usually within the top 10 of the most common fears people have. Public speaking, fear of heights, fear of mice, fear of flying are very, very common. In this one survey, going to the dentist happened to be the second most common fear. And, you know, the, the, what's the problem? The problem is pain, okay? How do we prevent pain? How do we prevent pain during dental treatment? And, and really, it's all about local anesthesia. This, we, we rely upon these drugs, okay? There, you know, I, I do general anesthesia, but that's not a viable alternative in, in, in virtually all dental offices, local anesthesia. And local anesthetics, as a group, are the major drug class that actually prevent pain. And what we're doing, if you go back, I'm, even though I'm not going to show this to you, go back to that brain with the fuse coming out. What we're doing is we're putting local anesthetic on that nerve between you, the surgeon, and the patient's brain. Okay? And when you stimulate that nerve, you still propagate that nerve impulse. But when the nerve impulse reaches the patient's, reaches where you put the local anesthetic on the nerve, it dies. They prevent the nerve impulse from reaching the patient's brain. So here's a good example of it. Patient comes into your dental office, they have a, a pain on a premolar. Every time that nerve impulse gets to that patient's brain, it's throbbing, it's aching, it's stabbing, whatever terms they're gonna use. What we're gonna do is we're gonna deposit local anesthetic on that nerve. Whether we do an infiltration over the apex or a little bit higher up, as you see it here, a middle superior alveolar nerve block. And as that local diffuses into the nerve, the nerve impulses are getting weaker and weaker. And when that nerve is fully blocked, fully saturated, as you see right now, even though that tooth is still firing off, we are blocking the impulse from reaching the brain. And that's how local anesthetics work, in a simplistic version, if you will, but that's how they work. Local anesthetics, when used properly, are the safest and the most effective drugs we have in all of medicine for preventing and managing pain. And these are the five drugs we have. Now, we're very fortunate here in North America. Uh, in Canada, United States, we happen to have all five of these wonderful drugs. Uh, I do a lot of traveling pre-pandemic, and there are many places in the world where some of these drugs aren't available. Most countries have articaine and lidocaine and mepivacaine. Not everybody has bupivacaine and not everybody has prilocaine, but articaine, 
lidocaine, mepivacaine are in fact the three most used local anesthetics worldwide. In fact, this is a, a, a slide of, of the numbers. I, I contacted the five, this is about two or three years ago, I contacted the five major manufacturers of local anesthetics in the, on the planet Earth. And they manufacture probably 95% of all the anesthetics we used in the dental profession. One billion lidocaine cartridges are used annually in the dental profession. One billion. 600 million articane, 300 million mepivacaine, and smaller numbers of prilocaine and bupivacaine. And when you add this up, the dental profession uses annually just short of two billion cartridges. Also keep in mind that there are countries like India and China where a lot of local anesthetics are used in multi-dose vials, not in cartridges. So we do use quite a lot of local anesthetics. And as it says here, these form the backbone of, local, of pain control techniques in dentistry, local anesthetics. You know, if uh, Monday, let's take Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. If Monday were a drug-free day in dentistry, what could you do? I mean, it wouldn't affect the orthodontist at all. But, and, and there are probably some procedures that you could do, but most of what you normally would do, you couldn't because of the lack of pain control. That's how important these drugs are to us. So again, it's all about pain and preventing pain. And as I said, the number one fear dental patients have is fear of pain. And how important to our patients is pain-free dental treatment? Well, this is Jennifer D. St. George, and I think most of you, have you gone to any major dental convention in the United States, ADA meeting anywhere, uh, the Hinman meeting in Atlanta, the New York meeting, Chicago Midwinter meeting, the California meetings. Uh, she is a, pra a practice management consultant and um, published a paper back in 2004. And the title of the paper is How Dentists Are Judged by Patients. So in other words, if you you listening were not a dentist, okay, uh, you, you were a lay person and you moved from the city you, in which you live, you, you moved to Wisconsin, to Mequon, Wisconsin, for example, and you go to your next door neighbor because you're looking for a dentist. And you would ask your, your, your friend, uh, your neighbor, do you have a good dentist? And this is how the lay person defines a good dentist. Okay, now look at number four, keeping on schedule. We are good at that. Look at number three, kind, professional, warm, caring, and helpful staff. We're very good with that. But what I want you to see is, the, and this is the reason I'm showing this to you, look at number two and number one. They're both about pain. Okay, the patient wants a dentist who doesn't hurt and one who can give a painless injection. By the way, I'm using that word dentist to include in this case, the dental hygienist, because we may have some hygienists listening here today. So allow me to use that word dentist to include anybody in this audience who is administering local anesthesia. But the number two and number one most important things that patients are looking for is a pain-free dental experience. So let's then talk for a couple of minutes about what is called the pain reaction threshold. And the pain reaction threshold is literally the point at which a person will interpret a given stimulus as being painful. Whether it's taking your finger and pressing it against their shoulder harder and harder and harder until they say, ow, or blowing air at their lip or giving an injection. When that person says, ow, stop, it hurts. The pain reaction threshold is very, very subjective. It's entirely subjective. And I think from your experience, you understand that a high pain threshold is good. There are times when you've done procedures, let's say without local anesthesia, and you're doing something for that patient that you know can be painful. And they're sitting there, fine. That's good, we like that. The low pain threshold is bad. And as I mentioned before, blowing air in a patient's mouth or touching him with a finger and that patient goes out, a very, very low pain threshold. So I wanna look at this, what is called the normal distribution curve, and because of the shape, it is called the bell-shaped curve. And this will explain a lot about how people respond, how drugs work, whatever, but it's that dark blue area, or the light blue area in the center. And that is the normal response to whatever. So let's say for a moment, I have a drug, lidocaine with epinephrine, 
that in theory should give us one hour's worth of pulpal anesthesia. Now, why am I saying that in theory? Because if you gave a thousand people lidocaine with epinephrine by maxillary infiltration, 68% will have one hour's worth of pulpal anesthesia, approximately. But another 15%, let's say in the left-hand part of this slide, the anesthesia will wear off in 20 minutes. And on the right-hand side of the slide, the other 15%, approximately, the anesthesia will last longer than an hour. So let's go and take a look at give names to these groups, okay? The people who respond the way they're supposed to, the ones who got an hour's worth of pulpal anesthesia out of that drug, are the normal responders. The patients who lost anesthesia in 15 or 20 or 30 minutes are hyporesponders to that drug, and the ones who had anesthesia going an hour and a half or two hours are the hyper-responders. And that's the way it is for almost everything we could be discussing. But that's why this is the average dose of it. If you say that this, the, the normal dose, the average dose of this drug for an adult is 10 milligrams, it's all because of this curve. It's the blue area in the center, the normal responding patient. Problem, fear of dentistry, fear of pain, lower the pain threshold. And that's not good. They, scared patients, and you know this in your clinical experience, scared patients overreact to stimulation. Things that we're doing that are, are non-painful, they are responding to it as though it were painful. And what that really implies is this. You know, this, this slide right here, uh, if you look at a, a typical endodontic practice, specialist, endodontic specialist, the percentage of hyper-responders that they see, patients who are fearful, they have infection, they're hard to get numb because of infected teeth. Endodontists don't see 15% of patients who have a low pain threshold. They probably see 25, 30, 40% of those patients because fear of dentistry, fear of pain, infection, whatever, and a lot of other items come in. It makes them very, very difficult patients to treat, and especially when it comes to achieving profound pulpal anesthesia. So again, we go back to these five drugs, and I'm not going to be discussing these drugs per se until the end of the program. I'll discuss one of them in particular. But as I said earlier, if you, I didn't say it earlier, actually, but when you deposit a local anesthetic close to a nerve, it will produce pain control. Now, that is not an absolute, because anybody out there who's ever treated an infected mandibular molar realizes what, I, what this slide says is not always true. Let's take a look at these three nerves. These are three mandibular nerves. What we're gonna do is give an injection, and there it is. We're gonna put a purple local anesthetic in the middle of this Petri dish. And usually after an alveolar nerve block, the doctor will leave the room, uh, leaving hopefully a dental assistant with that patient. Never leave a patient alone after you've given a local anesthetic injection while you're waiting for the onset of anesthesia. But this is what is happening in that usually 10-minute period while the doctor is waiting for anesthesia. The drug is diffusing. It is diffusing in a three-dimensional manner. So let's now say it's 10 minutes later, you, the doctor, come back into the room, and let's take a look at that nerve in the bottom of the slide at about 7 o'clock. Okay, patient is named Stanley. Stanley, are you numb? I bite my lip. I bite my tongue. That's what your patients normally do. Yes, doc, I'm numb. And you pick up your handpiece, your Gracie, your scalpel, your forceps, and you do the procedure, and the patient says, I didn't feel a thing. That is what you want. That nerve on the bottom is thoroughly saturated, profound anesthesia. Let's now go to the nerve up at the top of the slide at about 1 o'clock. So you came into the room in 10 minutes, and you asked the patient, Stanley, are you numb? I bite my lip. I bite my tongue. Daca. Nope. Doesn't feel any different at all. Missed entirely. 4 o'clock. Okay, four o'clock nerve, uh, walk back into the room at ten, in 10 minutes, ask the patient, are you numb? Stanley bites his lip, he bites his tongue. Yes, doc, I am numb. You pick up your handpiece, your scalpel, forceps, whatever it may be, and you start cutting. And if you're drilling on that tooth, when you get down to dentin, the patient jumps out of that chair. Okay, we got partial anesthesia on that four o'clock nerve. We got the soft tissue, we didn't get the pulp. 
This is what this entire thing is about. We want to get that nerve at seven o'clock. You want to saturate all the fibers in that nerve. That's what provides profound focal anesthesia. The problem that we have with local anesthetics is that they need to be injected. And you've all heard this. I think everybody out there who's listening to me has heard, had a patient say this or ask them, Doc, you have to give me a shot to do this. Now, if we have anybody from Canada listening in today, Doc, do you have to freeze me to do this? That's the common term used up, up north in Canada. And you also might have heard this, doctor, I hate getting shots, but once I'm numb, I'm okay. That's the thing that patients don't like. The act of receiving the injection is, re is perceived by most patients and sadly by a lot of dentists as the most traumatic part of the dental experience. There are many dentists who just don't like giving injections because it's they know their patients don't like it and we care, we don't wanna hurt our patients. This is the problem we have. And fear, you know, trypanophobia is actually what we're talking about right now. And trypanophobia in English means fear of needles. Very, very, very common fear. So let's take a look at the typical dental armamentarium for local anesthesia. Uh, we have the syringe, we have the needles, we have the dental cartridges, and we have topical anesthetics. The syringe was invented in 1853 by a French physician named Charles Bravaz, and that's what it looks like. Take a look at what we're using in the year 2020. Not very different from 1853. The metal syringe, I mean, I, I could use negative terms, a clunky, scary looking metal syringe. Uh, here's another couple of them. And one thing I wanna mention about these two syringes, especially the one on the bottom, is that there are many people out there who have smaller hands. And the thumb ring on, on the top, typical large thumb ring, your finger is lost in there. And it makes aspirating very, very difficult to do. On the bottom, you have a syringe with a small thumb ring. So if anybody out there in the audience does have small hands, uh, you might want to look into purchasing a syringe that does have a small thumb ring. It makes it a lot easier for you to administer local anesthesia. Back to Jennifer D. St. George. Keep in mind that the number two and number one most important things in that survey were painless injections and a doctor or hygienist who does not hurt. So the question then is, can we administer painless injections? And I would say to you uh, that the answer is yes. In virtually all situations, painless injections can be administered. Will they always work? No. But you can administer local anesthetics painlessly. Let's then talk about painless injections. How do we do it? Well, number one is topical. Topical works. Please believe me, topical works if you, if you do it properly. Okay. If you take a topical anesthetic and you're taking a, an applicator stick, Okay. First of all, you're going to dry the tissue with a two by two. You're going to take a small amount of topical and place it on that cotton swab and place it at the site of needle penetration and leave it there for at least a minute, preferably two minutes. And what you've now done is you've anesthetized the outermost two to three millimeters of soft tissue, which means anywhere in the mouth, including the palate, you can penetrate that soft tissue. Now, everywhere else in the mouth, except in the palate, once you go in, once you puncture the outermost mucous membrane, the rest of that injection, the rest of the path in, there's no, it, it won't hurt. You've done it. But on the palate, as we'll discuss in just a little bit, once you're in, the, the rest of that soft tissue is dense and it's firmly adherent to bone. So there's some other things that we have to do. But benzocaine and lidocaine, of course, are the most commonly used topical anesthetics. The brand names, of course, are, are, are different. They have flavoring in them. But I want to mention diclonide. Uh, it's, a, it's a topical anesthetic that was around for a long time. It was, it was gone, taken away from the market, but has been recently reintroduced. And it's a good topical anesthetic. It has an onset of, of anesthesia within two to 10 minutes. But I really, the, the thing that's important about this drug is its duration. Diclonine has a 30-minute duration of action. So 
This would be useful, especially in situations where you're going to be doing scaling and root planing. And if you have an option, let's say, of giving an injected local anesthetic or using topical, especially in the mandible, because if you're going to be doing uh, an inferior alveolar nerve block for scaling and root planing in the lower right quadrant, it's going to work. Your block is going to work, most likely. But when that patient leaves your office, they're going to still have soft tissue anesthesia of the tongue and of the lip for about three to four hours. Using a topical with a long duration of action like diclinine, uh, you have 30 minutes worth of working time and the lip and tongue will not be numb. So you might want to consider this in situations where you're doing especially scaling and root planning procedures uh, in lieu of giving the injection of a local anesthetic. So number one is topical anesthesia. It works. Leave it, dry the tissue, a little bit of topical at the site of needle injection, okay? and it's gonna to work to get the two to three millimeters of soft tissue anesthetized. The second part, and probably the most important thing, is slow deposition of the anesthetic solution. So let's go back to when you took your national boards, and the question might have been, what is the ideal rate of local anesthetic administration? And the answer is one milliliter per minute. Well, what that actually means then, if you're giving a patient a full cartridge, 1.8 mLs, 1.7, which is really not true, uh, most cartridges contain approximately 1.76 mLs of anesthetic. That's a trivia point that's irrelevant right now. But that would mean you're administering a full cartridge in about two minutes. Well, is that done? And the answer is no. This is a survey that I did back in the late 1990s. I had it published in my textbook back in 1997. But I surveyed 209 dentists, anonymous, and, and I asked them, I gave them you know, choices, how long do you take when you administer a full dental cartridge? 84% of them admitted to administering it in 20 seconds or less. Okay, and that's fast. That is way too fast. Now, if accidentally they had administered that local anesthetic into a vein, intravascular injection, that would have produced a massive overdose reaction, which would have been a seizure. Recommended, okay? Now, you know, recommended is the fact that, if I go back to the slide, most dentists are not gonna inject one ml per minute. They're gonna be much more rapid, much faster than that. So this is the recommendation. The recommendation is one, if you're gonna give a cartridge, a full cartridge, spend 60 seconds. That's twice as fast. That's twice as fast as the, as the ideal, but it's still safe and it's comfortable. So if you are gonna give a full cartridge, uh, inferior alveolar or Gau Gates mandibular block, all right, spend a minute. Now keep, also keep in mind that for most injections, you're not doing that. You know, in the maxilla, you're putting in a third of a cartridge. Okay, 0 0.6 mLs, that should take you 20 seconds. This is going to make your injection a lot more comfortable. And comfortable, slow is comfortable. Fast is going to hurt. And what we want is slow and comfortable. So is it possible? Can we do it? Can we do slow? Can we do comfortable for all intraoral injections? That leads me to a discussion of C-CLAD computer-controlled local anesthetic delivery. And you probably maybe not have heard of C-CLAD, but you've heard of the wand. The wand was introduced to the dental profession back in 1997. And the picture on the left is the original device. It is, uh, works on electricity. It sits on an instrument table, a bracket table. It has a foot pedal, which activates the device. We'll talk about this in just a moment. This was the original one. And the man behind this is a dentist named Mark Hockman. Mark Hockman is, Hockman is in New York. He is a periodontist and orthodontist at New York University College of Dentistry. And uh, over the years, of course, Mark and I, of course, but Mark and I have become friends. And I'll be honest with you, he is the brains. He is the genius behind these computerized devices. Most of the patents and such, are they, they came right from Mark. This is the first paper he published. It was published in the New York State Dental Journal back in 1997. And uh, in this study, it was a blinded study. Two, uh, 50 dentists were involved. Each of them 
administered and received two palatal injections. Okay, one was with the new device, the wand, the other one was with a traditional syringe. And they used what is called a visual analog scale to assess, in quotes, the pain. So you see this in many studies, all studies that we do, which involve pain, uh, you see the, the initials VAS, and that stands for visual analog scale. To use it diagrammatically or emoji-like, if you will, um, on the left-hand side, a zero is, I felt nothing. On the right-hand side, a 10 is the worst pain imaginable. On the bottom, uh, in a graphic form, if you will, zero to 10, uh, zero. Now, when we do these studies, uh, we ask, we do a procedure, we ask a patient on a scale of zero to 10, what did you feel? If it's three or less, three, two, one, or zero, then the procedure was comfortable. This is the result of that survey by Dr. But of that study by Dr. Hockman. The green bars are the wand, the C-clad device. The yellow is the same doctors getting the same injection using a traditional syringe. And it's very easy to see the difference that the, the lower numbers are the green bars and the higher numbers are the yellow bars, which would be the traditional syringe. And in that study, 96% of the dentists, again, blinded study, 96% of the dentists preferred the C-clad device to the traditional syringe. Now, on this graph, the red line, palatal injection, very dense tissue, tissue firmly adhering to bone. So when you take that syringe of yours and you go in, you're down to where you want to put the volume of local anesthetic in, I would say, especially in the upper anterior region of the palate, your hand is shaking. Now, it's not shaking because you're nervous or anything. It's shaking because the pressure, you have to push that syringe so hard to get the drug out. And that's what produces the pain. With the C-clad device, you're not doing anything. Except, and I'll show you the syringe in just a moment. You're just holding this little device that looks like a pen. And you step on a foot pedal. And you see the green line? It simply, it, 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 it senses the pressure of the tissue and it delivers the drug at a certain prefix rate. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. Very, very simple. These are two more recent studies showing exactly the same thing. Um, the, the, a lot of studies have been done on children. And all the studies going back to the early 2000s, all the studies essentially show the same thing that these devices work very, very well, makes the injection much more comfortable uh, for children, for adults, whatever it may be. A paper published in uh, 2019, and uh, these patients who received either a traditional injection and or a, a computerized device, but less pain was perceived by the patients who got the computerized device and the patients who got the computerized device wish to have it used again in the future. Patients want it. And this is what the newest version of the, of the C-clad wand looks like. It's called the STA wand. The STA stands for single tooth anesthesia. This is the actual handpiece or the wand. It looks like a saliva ejector, doesn't it? With a needle on it. Not that clunky metal syringe I showed you earlier, clunky metal again, using those negative adjectives, of course, but that's what they are. They, they, they go back to 1853. They haven't changed all that much. This is much more non-threatening to the patient. Now, worldwide, there are many of these devices available, many of them. Uh, the, the wand is still the number one worldwide, but many others have been, uh, have been developed. And, this is uh, what I want to talk about for a couple of minutes is the most recent. And, you know, things start out, and you remember the old, if you're old enough, the cell phones that look like bricks. And now cell phones have gotten smarter, and they've also gotten smaller. Well, the wand is a larger device, and it works off electricity. And it's a great device. The new generation, the DentaPen, which is what I want to talk about for a few minutes, uh, is miniaturized and it works off a battery. So what I wanna do, if you look at the right-hand side of this picture, by the way, uh, size-wise, 
they, they're essentially, it is the same size as a traditional syringe. Not much different. Battery operated, I'll, I'll go into the, the different speeds and whatever in just a little bit. And the fact that you can use standard dental cartridges and standard needles. So here's a little uh, animation that, the, that, that without any sound talks about this new device called the Dentapen. Okay, I love uh, videos. So these are the components of it. And uh, these are a couple of pictures I took of a dentist friend of mine who does use this in his private practice. Uh, easy to hold, easy to administer the anesthetic drug. Uh, the button is on there. Uh, we have the on off button, okay. We have the, uh, on the bottom, when you're done, you press that button to retract the plunger and you can remove the syringe and reload the next one. Three speeds. Fast speed, which is one ml in 30 seconds, a full cartridge over one minute, which is what I recommended earlier. Medium would be a million, one ml over 60 seconds, which would be a full cartridge over uh, two minutes, okay? Which would be my, the ideal, if you will, that national board answer. And then again, the slow rate, which is a full milliliter over 90 seconds. And what are you gonna use them for? So on the right-hand side of this slide, uh, the fast rate would be for techniques like the inferior alveolar, the gal gates, mandibular blocks. The uh, medium would be for infiltrations. This would be the one you probably would use the most. And then when you're doing things like uh, uh, PDL injections or palatal injections, where you're putting the drug into a very dense tissue, you'd want to use the slowest rate. The ramp up mode, and it can be used in any of the three uh, speeds. But as I said earlier, you know, slow injections are more comfortable. So what the ramp up mode does is it starts out your injection. If you look at the graph, it starts out the administration of the drug slowly. And once that drug gets in and the tissue now begins to get numb, it slowly ramps up the speed. At that point in time, the patient can no longer feel the drug going in. So there's something you might want to look at. It's a really nice, uh, part of this device. It can be used with any of the three speeds to make the injection a lot more comfortable. It aspirates and you can use it with any traditional dental needle. This is a paper I was involved with. It was just published in May of this year. And essentially what we did was we compared. We compared the, uh, the STA wand which, with the Dentapen. And the patients received the Pivocaine plane. They received two palatal injections with the wand and the Dentapen and the VAS scale was used. The results on the right-hand side of the slide, both of them were about the same, 2.35, 2.4, both within the range of comfort. Most of the patients with both devices said they experienced mild pain. No patient in this study experienced severe pain. So yes, slow and comfortable. Slow and comfortable is possible for all dental injections, absolutely. Now, because of these C-clad devices, let me just talk about these innovations in technique, if you will. 
Firstly, the periodontal ligament injection. Now, that's not a new injection. It's been around prior to the CQAD devices being introduced. However, when you're doing a PDF, people always, doctors would come over to me and ask me, Dr. Malamud, how do you give a painless PDL injection? I would say well, they shouldn't hurt. And the reason you're putting that drug, a little bit of anesthetic, 0.2 to 0.4 milliliters per root into the PDL space, which is not existent. And when you push hard, the drug doesn't diffuse, it tears the PDL, it's gonna be painful. If you inject it slowly, the local diffuses into the interproximal bone and it's painless. These devices make doing PDL injections much more comfortable. Two injections that were discovered accidentally, if you will, with these new devices. The anterior middle superior alveolar nerve block. Now, I'm not, I can't go into technique because of the time limitation, but if you look at the right-hand side of the slide and you see the top picture where the uh, anesthesia is going to be, you're going to give this injection on the palate. Okay, topical anesthesia, you know, and, and everything you do to make it comfortable. But what you're getting is you're getting the hemi palate, you're getting the entire palate on that side, in addition to pulpal anesthesia of the incisors, canine, and premolars. If you're not doing an AMSA injection as yet, look it up. It's something worth learning how to do. And the other injection that was invented, if you will, using CCLAD was the PASA, which is a palatal approach to the anterior superior alveolar nerve block. So that's our discussion of computer controlled local anesthetic delivery. Uh, the original, the traditional device, the wand, the new, relatively new, not relatively new, but the, the innovation, the smaller battery operated, the Dentapen. So let's then turn to part three of this presentation. And that is a discussion of the local anesthetic Articane. Articane was synthesized in 1969 in Germany, introduced into the, into the world in 1976 in Germany. Articane represents the only local anesthetic ever that was designed for the dental profession. All the other locals, every other one was a medical drug. It was found in a multi-dose uh, vial, and we took it and put it in cartridges. Canada got Articane in 1985. The United States got Articane in the year 2000. As I mentioned earlier, Articane today is the second most used dental local anesthetic worldwide with approximately 600 million cartridges being used. The two most popular formulations of Articane are 4% with epinephrine 1 in 100,000, 4% with epinephrine 1 in 200,000. And these are the versions we have in North America. Outside of North America, interestingly enough, there are different versions of it available, even though the two I mentioned are still the most popular, but Articane 4% with epinephrine 1 in 400,000, Articane 4% plain, and Articane 2% with epinephrine 1 in 200,000. Again, we don't have these here in North America. Market share, 98% in Germany. It's their drug. They introduced it. They synthesized it. Poland, 90%. France, 70%. Spain, 68%. Italy, 53%. And in the third quarter of 2019, the United States, Articane was 41%. Lidocaine was still number one with about 48%, but Articane in 2019 was 41%. Proprietary names of Articane here in the US, Articadent, Oroblock, Septocaine and Zorcaine. On the upper right, left hand side of the screen, you have the traditional, the classical ester type local anesthetic, and that is procaine. And in that blue circle, that is the ester linkage. That is what gives this drug the definition of the category of ester type local anesthetic. There's an ester linkage there. On the right hand side of the slide on top, you see lidocaine, which is a prototypical. Amide. And in red, that circle, that is the amide linkage. On the bottom is articane. Articane is classified as an amide local anesthetic, but in fact, it is a hybrid. Articane has both the 
amide linkage, red, and the ester linkage in blue. But we do classify it as, a, as an amide since most of its clinical properties belong to the amide category. Let's then talk about articaine a little bit. Why do I, I'm gonna tell you right now in advance, I like articaine. Uh, the amide local anesthetics, the ones that you're using, lidocaine, mepivacaine, prilocaine, bupivacaine, once that drug leaves the nerve and enters into the blood, the amides have to travel into the liver to be metabolized. And the elimination half-life of a drug, of these four drugs, is approximately 90 minutes. The blood level of lidocaine decreases by 50% in an hour and a half. And it takes six half-lives for the drug to be eliminated from the body. So six times 90 is 540 minutes or nine hours. Esters, procaine, for example, novocaine, procaine, once they leave the nerve, they enter into the capillaries, the process of metabolism starts immediately. And the half-life of procaine is six minutes. Six times six is 36 minutes. Procaine is eliminated from your body in 36 minutes. Articaine, the hybrid molecule, ester and amide, 90 to 95% of its metabolism occurs in the blood, just like an ester. And the elimination half-life of articaine is 20 to 27 minutes in adults, 18 to 23 minutes in children. Take 27 minutes times six half-lives, it's 162 minutes. Articaine is eliminated from the body in an hour and four, in two hours and 42 minutes. This is a study done by Wolfgang Jakob in Germany, showing you the blood levels after administration of 120 milligrams of each drug, but the blood levels of lidocaine and articaine. And it's very, very simple. Uh, the, the blood level of articaine decreases dramatically more rapidly than lidocaine. For that reason, I believe that articaine is the preferred local anesthetic in pregnant patients, in nursing mothers, in pediatric and geriatric patients. And that's because of its shorter half-life. It's also indicated for mandibular infiltration in adults because of its increased lipid solubility, which I'll get into in just a moment or two. So for this reason, these reasons, okay, the increased lipid solubility and the, the shorter half-life, it is my opinion that articaine is a better local anesthetic than lidocaine, mepivacaine, or prilocaine. Okay, and the answer to me is yes. Let me, I, I really wanna show you the reason why as I finish up the presentation. Articaine is more lipid soluble compared to other local anesthetics. It, what, what that means simply is it diffuses through soft and hard tissue better than the other local anesthetics. So let's look at the mandible because you know, the, the, in quotes mandibular block, every dentist out here who's a hygienist and dentist has had a mandibular slump where you can't hit. Patients come in and you've gotten them numb the first time every time forever, but in the last week or so, you can't hit the broad side of the barn. Everybody has a mandibular slump. Now, maxillary infiltration is easy because the bone is thin. The drug diffuses through the cortical plate of bone. But in the mandible in adults, that cortical plate of bone in most patients is dense and mandibular infiltration simply doesn't work, especially in the molar region. So let's take a look at some studies that were done. And we're talking about using articaine by mandibular buccal infiltration in adult patients. And in the first study I wanna show you, it was used as the sole injection just doing an infiltration, no block being given. And in this study, what they did was they, they infiltrated a full cartridge of either lidocaine or articaine in the buccal fold adjacent to the mandibular first molar. They pulp tested four teeth, the two premolars, the two molars, every three minutes. Success was, predicate, was predicated upon two consecutive pulp tests with no response to maximum stimulation. And just look at these numbers over here. Keep in mind that they injected the drug by the mandibular first molar. 
Lidocaine was 57% successful, which is pretty good, but articaine was 87. Look at the second premolar, 92%, 86% on the first premolar. And all of these values, all of these values were highly statistically significant. Again, this was using articaine at only by mandibular infiltration by a mandibular first molar. There's a reason for it. Articaine, as I said earlier, is more lipid soluble than other local anesthetics. Uh, without going into it because of the time factor, articaine possesses a thiophene ring. All local anesthetics have to have an organic ring to be lipid soluble. All the other local anesthetics have benzene. Articaine has a thiophene ring. Simple, thiophene ring is more lipid soluble than a benzene ring. Okay, let's take a look now at using articaine by buccal infiltration after you've given a patient an inferior alveolar nerve block. And in this study, the patients came in and received a lidocaine inferior alveolar nerve block. Pulp testing was done, and the success rate was 55.6%. The same, by the way, these patients got the lidocaine mandibular block to use that term. Then they either got a sham injection in the buccal fold, which means they got nothing, or they got a cartridge of articaine infiltrated in the buccal fold by the first molar. So in what you're seeing here, this is the lidocaine block without the articaine buccal infiltration. Same patients came back. Take a look at that line on top. This is what happened. 55% became 91.7% success. And the reason, very simply, was that articaine diffuses through that bone a heck of a lot better than the other local anesthetics. And one of the things I've been recommending in my full-day courses when we used to give full-day courses in cities all over the United States was I, I would highly recommend, and I'm highly recommending to you right now, that regardless of what local anesthetic you're using to give your block, whether it's lidocaine, mepivacaine, prilocaine, or articaine, always supplement your inferior alveolar nerve block with an articaine buccal infiltration at the apex in the buccal fold, at the apex of whatever mandibular molar you're treating. Now, if you're treating the first and second mandibular molars, you give the injection by the second mandibular molar. And you're going to see, look at the slide, you're going to see a dramatic increase in your success in focal anesthesia. So that's articaine. So these are the three things I discussed with you this, this afternoon, evening, uh, how important our, these drugs are for our profession, the backbone of pain control in dentistry, how to give painless injections, and our discussion of the local anesthetic articaine. So my email address one more time, malamid at usc.edu. If anybody has any questions for me, even though we may have a chance to discuss a couple right now, but if anybody wants to contact me later, please feel free to do so. There's my email address. And with that, uh, Henry Schein uh, would like you to visit their website to take a look at the, the Dentapen. C-Clad works. C-Clad works, and the, the innovation, again, uh, the wand, the original device, is still out there, and it's still a very good device. The Dentapen uh, is, is smaller, handheld, works on a battery. It's something worth looking at. So again, takeaways, look into computerized devices, and look at Articane by buccal infiltration in the mandibular fold, okay? And with that, uh, let me throw it back to Adam, okay? And uh, thank you all very, very much. And by the way, all of you, have a wonderful Thanksgiving, a safe and wonderful Thanksgiving. Good evening. Great. Thank you for that presentation. We've got a couple of questions for you. The first one is, would you recommend Articane for children under six years old? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, uh, the package insert says four years of age and above. But I, I can go off on a very big tangent, discuss the use of Articane in children who are two and three years of age. But the reason, again, the, the one who said six years of age uh, is actually misreading the package insert, which says four years of age and above. And the reason it says in the package insert four years of age and above is the research that we did. USC was 
the there were 29 dental schools in the U.S. and the U.K. who were involved in getting Articane on the market here in the U.S. and U.K. Phase three clinical trials, the same thing that's happening now with the COVID, uh, the, the, the COVID vaccines, phase three clinical trials. And in our clinical studies of 1,332 patients, we enrolled patients in our studies from four years of age and up. So we proved the FDA that Articane was both safe and effective in four years of age and above patients. So the answer to that doctor's question is, yeah, of course you can use it in six-year-olds and five-year-olds and four-year-olds. But there's a lot of research out there on patients who are three and two years of age, and it's very, very safe. And the reason it's so safe is the half-life, the fact that it's gone from the body in a child within 20 to 27 minutes. It's eliminated more rapidly. So it's a very, very safe drug in the young pediatric population. Right. By the way, Adam, before you do that, if that doctor would like to contact me, I will be able to gladly send you, let me go back to this slide right here, I will be glad to send you articles that talk about the use of articane in under four years of age children. So I'll leave this slide up for the time being, okay? Could you briefly summarize what health conditions or medications preclude the use of epi? <laughs> okay, um, primarily it is a patient with heart disease, cardiovascular disease, that we would classify as an ASA4. Okay, so let's go back for a moment, okay? Because I, I have a feeling that most of you out there, when you did your dental training, your hygiene training, were introduced in physical evaluation to the American Society of Anesthesiologists Physical Status Classification System. So your patient comes into your dental office, they fill out a medical history questionnaire, and you do their vital signs. Okay, we assess risk. An ASA1 is a patient who after reviewing the medical history, recording the vital signs, perfectly normal. There's nothing wrong. They're an ASA1. They're a green light. Go for it. Now, do bad things ever happen to healthy patients? Of course. But the risk is minimal. Okay, the ASA2 patient is a pale yellow. And it's a patient who has a mild systemic disease. Uh, they're they're a, a, a type 2 I'm sorry, a type 2 diabetic. A, a non-insulin dependent diabetic, uh, a patient who has well-controlled asthma, well-controlled epilepsy, uh, blood pressure that is a little bit high, but well-controlled. They have an underlying risk, but it's minimal. No problem there either. ASA3, a darker yellow. By the way, a yellow traffic light means proceed with caution, correct? Okay. Uh, it doesn't mean step on the gas and go through it. That's, that's supposed to proceed with caution. Um, an ASA3 has a, a medical problem or problems that limit activity, okay? Angina, chest pain on exertion, uh, a, a, an, an asthmatic who says to you, whenever I get nervous, upset, I have an asthmatic attack, and Dr. Malamud, please don't take this personally, but I hate going to the dentist. An epileptic with the same thing. They're well controlled. But when they get into a stressful environment, like a dental office, they're more likely to have a problem, an ASA-3. And that ASA-3 is still treatable. And using a local with epinephrine is perfectly okay. So now we're going to get down to the ASA-4. And the ASA-4 is a red flag. And the red flag, red light, means stop. So who are these patients? Uh, a patient who has had a myocardial infarction, in quotes, a heart attack, within the last six months. And that used to be an absolute. But the way the world is today with all the technology we have, it isn't. But for our purposes right now, if a person comes into your dental office who has had a myocardial infarction within the last six months, number one, dental treatment period, elective dental care should be postponed. But the use of epinephrine, even in a concentration like one in 200,000, would be contraindicated. A patient with blood pressure that is out of control. Now, what does out of control mean? I would say to you, and these are the numbers we used at the University of Southern California. By the way, I retired from the university back in 2013. So when we, I was there for those 40 years, if a patient came in with a systolic blood pressure, now both systolic, the upper number, and diastolic are both important. But when it comes to acute, acute life-threatening medical emergencies, 
It is the upper number, the systolic, that's more important. Now, they came in with a blood pressure systolic of 200 or higher. That was it. We're done. We're not even going to start. Okay? Uh, what are we going to do? We're gonna, you know, why is the blood pressure that, that high? Well, number one, it could be, well, doctor, my blood pressure is always much lower than that. It was 130 yesterday. Okay? This is called white coat hypertension. The patient's sitting in your chair. They're about to get an injection. They're scared. Or it could be a patient who has high blood pressure and is not taking their medication. One of the biggest problems we have with any kind of a drug where a patient has to take it on a long-term basis is called non-compliance. Patients don't take the drug as recommended. They take it the way they think it should be taken. So one of the things that you have to do as part of your every, every time you see that patient in your, in your office, you record their blood pressure because blood pressure changes within minutes. Okay, so let's go back to the question. I, I, I sort of went around here. Mainly it's cardiovascular problems. Uh, a myocardial infarction in the last six months, a blood pressure systolic above which you are uncomfortable. I said 200 at USC, you may, like, you may, you may be uncomfortable treating a patient above 160 systolic. Okay, but here's the, here's the important point. The important point is using a drug that is plain, 3% mepivacaine, for example, carbocaine, polocaine, isocaine, scandinesse, the brand names, 3% plain, because you don't want to use epinephrine. Keep in mind that plain local anesthetics, even though they have no epinephrine, don't, don't produce the same depth of anesthesia. And if you're doing a procedure that requires more profound anesthesia and you hurt that patient, the amount of endogenous epinephrine that they're gonna be releasing is so much greater than the amount of it in that anesthetic cartridge. You always have to keep that in mind when you want to avoid using epinephrine. But mainly it's, it's, it's patients with significant cardiovascular problems where you wanna use either no epinephrine, if that's the way you feel, or at least use the lowest concentration and the lowest concentration we have here in the U.S. is one in 200,000 in Canada as well. One in 200,000, which is found in prilocaine, which is Cedanes, and in articaine. Okay, that's the way to go. Adam, that was, that's my roundabout answer. Sounds good. We've got time for one more question. Um, any advantage to using articaine in the maxilla or palate? <sighs> any advantage? That's a very, that's a good question. The advantage, I love it. The advantage, I've never been asked that before, by the way. Um, obviously, uh, the advantages are in the mandible because the mandible is where the problems happen. And maxillary anesthesia, as a rule, is really not that hard to achieve. Infiltration usually works. You know, by the way, there are some patients in the maxilla that have bone that's thicker than it should be. And that's why sometimes infiltrations, especially uh, over a canine, or sometimes the, 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 the second and third molars, infiltrations don't work as well. But, but no, the, the, this, I don't think there's really any advantage over lidocaine, epivacaine, or prilocaine of articaine in a maxillary arch. You know, you could, you could use articaine for everything, but up to you. Uh, in the mandible, please, in the mandible, I strongly recommend, number one, either using articaine for your nerve block, and there is no problem with that. If you have any concern, email me. I'll send you a lot of information about that. But number one, using Articane for the block, you'll have a higher success rate. Or even if you use Articane by block or Lidocaine, Mepivacaine by block, please start infiltrating Articane after the block has been given in the buckle fold adjacent to the tooth you're going to be treating in the mandible. And you're going to see, as I said earlier, you're going to see dramatic increases in your success in the mandible. I promise that. Okay, Adam. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Malamed, for your presentation. I certainly enjoyed it, and I hope everyone did as well. And thank you to all of you for attending. Please feel free to email us at webinars at Henry Shine if you have additional questions pertaining to tonight's webinar, or feel free to email Dr. Malamed. On behalf of Henry Schein, I'd like to thank everyone again for attending. Stay safe and have a great evening. Thank you all.